morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, today we're going to talk about the Con Congressional Review Act and net neutrality uh, and Title II and things like that. Um, my name is Jim Dunstan. I'm the uh, brand new general counsel at Tech Freedom, uh, Washington, D.C. based think tank. Uh, and we have a great panel here today with one empty chair, um, which will get filled shortly um, here. Um, and so I want the, each of the panelists to introduce themselves, kind of where they're from, and more importantly, how long they've been working on the issues related to net neutrality. Starting at my far left, Baron. Uh, Baron Soka. Put your button. Sorry, <laughs> I should know better than that. Uh, Baron Soka, Tech Freedom. Uh, really delighted to have Jim join us. Uh, he's been a mentor of mine for the last um, 13 years, so great fun to work with him. Uh, and that's uh, almost as long as I've been suffering through net neutrality, because I was in, as many of you know, because I say this all the time, I was in Tim Wu's internet law class in 2002 when he was writing his paper about net neutrality. And even then, uh, I could see the debate starting with uh, Glenn Robinson, who had been a, uh, a commissioner at the, in the FCC in the 70s, on the other side of the debate about uh, exactly how to do this and what the FCC's authority would be and so on. Uh, little did I know that I would end up spending the rest of my life dealing with this. And when I say the rest of my life, I, I mean that because this is unfortunately not going to get resolved soon. Good morning. My name is Bennett Ross. I'm a partner at the law firm of Wiley Ryan here in Washington, D.C. Uh, I have been in the communications industry practicing uh, telecommunications law and related fields for uh, nearly 30 years. Uh, I have suffered through net neutrality uh, when I was in-house at Bell South corporation, which is now part of AT&T. I first started working on net neutrality when uh, then Congressman Markey introduced a bill in 2005 on the subject, which I believe was the first actual legislative effort uh, to uh, prescribe net neutrality rules, and thankfully that uh, was not successful. Uh, but our firm has been involved in uh, every major uh, litigation involving uh, net neutrality from the Comcast appeal to the Verizon uh, challenge to the most recent uh, challenge to the 2015 uh, open internet order. So uh, I um, we're introducing ourselves by saying how long we've been uh, sentenced to net neutrality punishment. Like one minute. Yeah. So as I was saying, um, I just looked it up. I, I innocently wrote an article in May of 2005 called Cure for the Common Carrier, um, of which was, the th I think, the very first thing I ever wrote about anything having to do with telecom law um, for now defunct publication called CIO Insight. And um, little did I know that it was a life sentence. Yeah, yeah it is a life sentence. Um, what was I doing? I was, in 2005, I was reading through, um, I think, a set of comments that the firm that I was working at, at Wilkie, Farr & Gallagher, had prepared on uh, uh, defending Comcast against the BitTorrent blocking. So it's it's been a while. I guess I've seen all sides of it as well. well and your background, Grace? Oh, sure. Um, uh, uh, I know a lot of you. Um, so uh, <laughs> I've worked. I, I worked for uh, uh, Fred Upton uh, uh, for about three and a half years. Um, as a uh, deputy chief counsel uh, for the committee subcommittee on commerce and tech, uh, sorry, communications and tech in energy and commerce, and then the past year I've spent um, at the White House under Gary Cohn, being um, uh, advising uh, folks on uh, tech, telecom, and cybersecurity. And currently, I am with DLA Piper, um, hopefully to do the same sort of thing. Great. Thanks, Grace. Uh, a couple of housekeeping matters. If you need to access to the Wi-Fi here, it is House Public, and the incredibly difficult uh, password of House Public, except for it's one word, initial H, initial P, cap, caps H, caps P, otherwise it'll kick you out. Uh, and we're tweeting using Title II as the hashtag today. Um, and please silence cell phones um, if you can. Um, so today's you know, we've all been around this issue for now, it looks like a decade or more. Um, the latest chapter on net neutrality um, is the Cong Congressional Review Act, and we're going to talk about that today, uh, kind of where it stands, where it's going, what it means, and is it the right way to go, or is a legislative solution better? So for those of you who don't follow this clo closely, CRA, or the Congressional Review Act, was an act 
uh, enacted by Congress in 1996. Uh, prior to this uh, administration, it was used exactly once um, in 2001 to overturn some um, Clinton uh, sort of 11th hour OSHA uh, rules on ergonomics. Um, however, it has been used by this administration 16 more times in the last year, uh, and so it's suddenly sort of, sort of come to the fore. Um, and what it does allow, uh, in theory, is for Congress to review and overturn uh, any regulation from an, an agency which it disagrees with. Um, however, since it's only been used once uh, up until last year, we have very little case law on what it actually means and what the meets and bounds of the CRA are. Um, and so last week I saw a video uh, on social media of someone using dental floss to cut a watermelon. And it was very cool, kind of stop action, and they were slicing it with this dent dental, dental floss. Um, and it, it, you know, it was very cool. And as I saw this, I sort of said, you know, I bet that's what some members of Congress think is going to happen with the CRA. They're just going to nicely slice you know, this, the, you know, this order from the FCC out and it just roll it back to what it was before. Well, I'm old enough, I'm of the generation, when I see a watermelon, I think of an implement, I think of Gallagher and a sledgehammer, hmm. you know, the sledgehammer. And, and, and if you've ever seen any of Gallagher's stuff, he takes a watermelon and he just beats the crud out and smashes all over the place. So today we're going to talk about is the CRA dental floss, a nice you know, instrument, or is it a blunt object like a sledgehammer that's going to mess up net neutrality for yet another generation? Um, so Baron, let's, let's talk about sort of the, you know, the meats and the depths of, of, uh, of the CRA and, and especially where we are. You know, it's been passed out of the Senate, 5247, it's now sitting over at the House. So what's, what's the House got to do next? Yeah, so, let, so, so I'll start with the posture of where we are and I'll let Bennett um, taken on the lead on some of the legal analysis. So uh, as you all know, uh, this past the Senate, the CRA provides for an accelerated procedure. So you don't need a 60-vote majority. You just need a, a fair majority to force a vote. And the uh, Senate Democrats did indeed force a vote. Three Republicans signed on. And now this issue is uh, in the House. The CRA does not provide an accelerated procedure in the House. Um, and so now this is sitting. And just to make every make sure everyone is clear, uh, there is no deadline specified for the vote. The um, FCC, it's restoring internet freedom order from December, technically goes into effect on June 11th. Uh, if the vote has not occurred by then, that order will go into effect. And that means specifically that the FCC will uh, undo the underlying uh, interpretations of what constitutes uh, telecommunications service, so broadband will no longer be subject to Title II. Uh, the FCC will take off the books uh, all but um, the transparency rule of the rules from the 2015 Open Internet Order. Uh, and if there is no CRA vote, all of that will happen. But it is also possible if the House does vote later this year, uh, and if the President chooses not to veto that resolution, it is possible that that CRA uh, could go into effect, and that would have the effect of undoing part of, and we'll talk about which parts, but part of the 2017 Restoring Internet Freedom Order. Now I want to emphasize as a procedural matter that there is no mechanism to force a vote, um, so it's, it's up to, to, to see what happens and how many, um, how many votes there are, whether they can muster a majority in the House. Um, but, but that's where things stand as a procedural matter, and then, as I say, the question is, exactly what would that CRA do? And before I turn it over to Bennett, I just want to note uh, some people, especially Hill staffers, have said to me, well, because of course our argument is that the, the thing that Congress thinks it's doing, the CRA really can't effectively do, that is to restore uh, the 2015 interpretation of Title II. And some staffers have asked me, well, but the Senate parliamentarian must have looked at this. Uh, surely they already bless this interpretation. Uh, and that, that's just not true. Um, there is a, a thing that the CRA can do here because at a minimum some parts of the 2017 Restoring Internet Freedom Order are rules and the rules are the things that the CRA can reverse and so yes there is it, it's not no one is saying that uh, the CRA would do nothing the question is whether it would simply uh, undo the rule parts of the 2017 order or the other parts of the 2017 order mainly the reinterpretation of Title II, and the question is whether that is a rule or an order. 
So Bennett, what's a rule, what's an order, and why do we care? Uh, just a good question. Before we get to that, I, I do want to follow up on what, what Barron said. So the, the, the Congressional Review Act, if it passes and is, is signed by the President, it will do one thing without dispute, and, and this is hardly ever talked about. It would uh, disapprove the FCC's transparency rule. For those of you who are familiar with net neutrality, transparency was a requirement actually adopted in 2010 uh, as part of that uh, open internet order, carried through in 2015, and then recodified and, uh, and reinterpreted in the Restoring Internet Freedom Order. Uh, the Congressional Review Act would disapprove the rule that requires broadband providers to uh, disclose their network management practices, their uh, commercial terms and services uh, of their offerings, uh, and their network performance. Uh, nobody really has disagreed with the notion that transparency is a good thing in the broadband marketplace, and that broadband providers should be encouraged if not required uh, to disclose those things. But a CRA resolution would disapprove that rule. It, it goes off the books. And importantly, it would prevent the FCC from adopting substantially similar rules in the future absent an act of Congress. So n at no point could the FCC, if, again, if the CRA is enacted, could the FCC impose requirements on broadband providers to disclose information about their services. I have yet to hear anybody who is advocating for the Congressional Review Act as a responsible legislative solution to articulate why that outcome is a good thing. Um, so, so, Bennett, wh why couldn't the FCC just readopt the 2015 transparency rules? Well, because the, the Congressional Review Act was enacted to prevent that kind of administrative shenanigans where con what basically Congress does to the CRA is effectively alter the law to say that a, a, an agency does not have the authority to adopt rules or to do things in this area. And so the, the specific provision of the CRA which says, uh, upon a successful enactment of a CRA resolution of disapproval, an agency cannot adopt the same or substantially similar rules. Uh, and that, that obviously makes sense uh, in, in, as, a, as a legislative matter uh, because you wouldn't want Congress to have to go through this exercise repeatedly. So when Congress says an agency cannot act in this manner, it means Congress cannot act in this manner. Um, but to the to to point about the Jim's point about the the question of the rule versus order. So the the, res, the restoring internet freedom order did two other things beyond the transparency rule. It uh, it, it determined that uh, the prior rule should come off the books. So it rescinded the no blocking. Uh, no throttling, no paid prioritization, and the general internet conduct rule that were adopted in 2015. So the FCC did away with those rules. It also, as, as Barron has indicated, it reclassified broadband internet access service as an information service under Title I, which was the historic classification of that service really since the dawn of the commercial internet uh, in the 1990s. So, so what happens, what would the CRA resolution to do those two, two things? I, I've not heard anybody articulate how it is that a Congressional Review Act resolution of disapproval can resuscitate the rules that the FCC has done away with. Uh, again, if you look at the plain language of the, of the act, the, the Congressional Review Act is designed to allow Congress to disapprove a rule before it takes effect. Here you have rules that are no longer on the books, not taken back because they've been rescinded. Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense in, in that scenario for Congress to even care why an agency is not regulating when the Congressional Review Act was intended to allow Congress to oversee the manner in which con an agency was regulated. Um, so the, the, the way Congress, is, as everybody in this room knows, the way Congress imposes substantive obligations is to enact legislation. Uh, and the, if they were interested in, in a no prioritization rule or a no blocking or throttling rule, Article One of the Constitution sets forth the mechanism by which that happens. It's not the Congressional Review Act. Yeah, I just want to note here, um, even if you walk away unconvinced by anything that we say today about the CRA, remember Ben's point, there is no legal analysis that anyone has done publicly that um, purports to explain how the CRA can actually restore the uh, interpretation of Title II. The closest you will find to that is uh, Harold Fell, the public knowledge, wrote a response to our letter, um, which I hope will get printed out and available for distribution. Uh, 
probably Dan has a bunch of them. So you'll find both our original letter and also our response to Carolyn's blog post. And, and th that's it. There's no um, GAO memo, such as uh, Republicans recently got the GAO to issue for using the CRA to undo a CFPB guideline, right? That, that document clearly explained why the guideline was in fact a rule. And it's true that the CRA, in that sense, is, and if you look at the legislative history, which is very scant, there is uh, legislative uh, history language that very clearly says that the CRA is supposed to be interpreted broadly. So a rule, even if it's not called a rule, can't, and even if it didn't go through a rulemaking process, such as those CFPB guidelines, can still be a rule subject to the CRA. Where people have gotten confused about this is that the that uh, legislative history language means that anything that is a rule is covered by the CRA, period. It does not mean that things that are not rules are covered by the CRA. And here is the, the fundamental distinction that uh, Harold, for instance, since Harold's going to write about this and just single it out, that Harold misses. Harold asserts that rules uh, um, are a broad category that include uh, adjudicatory orders. And that's just not true. The, the basis of American administrative law is, in fact, to distinguish between rules on the one hand, which can include a lot of things, again, some of which might be guidelines that look informal, um, but those are things that are of uh, future effect, that uh, indicate how the agency is going to apply its authority in the future. They are fundamentally different from adjudicatory orders. Um, in, in that sense, they are future looking. They're about the agency's uh, discretion in how it um, essentially finishes the legislative function, how it effectively finishes writing, uh, filling in the gaps in the statute that Congress left to it. That's a fundamentally different matter from an adjudicatory proceeding, which uh, is one in which the agency says, no, this is what the statute means, and this is what it's, what it's always meant. So if you did something in the past, we can still fine you for it, make you pay a fee for it, right? That's a different um, tool. And, and it's not a, an arbitrary line. It's one that's drawn very clearly in the Administrative Procedure Act to which the CRA points in its definition of what it covers. And indeed, it's one that has ultimately constitutional moorings, which is that uh, Congress in the CRA can control the exercise of a legislative function. That's what Congress does. That's what Article I covers. Administrative agencies are a weird beast because most of what they do, generally speaking, is that legislative Article uh, One function. But they also fill a role of doing adjudication, which is a judicial function, right? They're effectively the first layer of the judicial system. And when they're operating in that function, in that adjudicatory function, Congress can't jump in and, and, and reverse what they've done any more than Congress can jump in and reverse a judicial decision, right? That's ultimately what we're talking about here. And I'll leave it to Bennett to explain a little more about why we know that's the case. And I just, just want to put one pin on this, which is to say that I understand that um, Democrats are very upset about, one, the way that the CRA was used to repeal the broadband privacy order in 2016, and two, the way that the Republicans just used the CRA to repeal the CFPB guidance. I get it, right? CRA is a blunt tool. One can raise all sorts of concerns about that. But my concern here is that in, in a way to retaliate against this, uh, Democrats are opening a door that they really don't want to open. Because if you start to erode that line between uh, rules and orders, the CRA is not just a blunt tool. It's a blunt tool that can be used to undermine everything, the entire administrative state. And not just by Congress. If you say that things that, that are really truly orders are subject to the CRA, that doesn't, doesn't just mean that Congress could, could use the CRA to reverse those things, going back all the way to 1996, because of course they were never sent to Congress, so they never went into effect. But you also open the door for private defendants to say to administrative agencies that come and try to enforce uh, some decision against them, say, hey, that was never sent to Congress. That was so that was a rule, and it would never went into effect. In other words, Democrats could be opening the door to the destruction of the administrative state. Now, ultimately, I believe the courts will stop them because they'll recognize this distinction. That could take a very long time, and in the meantime, we could have complete chaos.
And I, don't, I just have a few things to add to what Baron said, but I think he's, he's nicely summarized the, the, the issue. But there's no doubt, there can be no doubt, should be no doubt, that the APA distinguishes rules from orders. I mean, plain as day, in, in the Administrative Procedure Act, there should be no dispute that the Congressional Review Act only points to rules as being subject to the legislation. Um, so what is an order versus a, a rule? And I think I, I agree with what Barron has described as the, as the distinction. But in the context of net neutrality, when it comes to the reclassification decision, the determination that broadband internet access is an information service rather than a telecom service or vice versa, uh, the, the commission did that by means of a declaratory ruling. That is part and parcel of the exercise of the FCC's adjudicatory authority. The definition of an order is the outcome of an adjudication. An adjudication is by definition a, uh, a, a case-specific or fact-specific determination uh, used to dis resolve a disputed set of facts. Well, all you have to do is read the 2015 Open Internet Order and the 2017 Restoring Internet Freedom Order. That's exactly what both FCCs did in those cases. It resolved disputed facts about what is broadband internet access service. How does DNS play into it? What, is, what are providers actually offering to their customers? What are they marketing, speeds versus other functionality? That, that, that is the essence of an adjudication and that is the essence of an order. And, and I would submit to you that if, if, uh, if folks look hard at this, they could not reasonably conclude that the FCC's determination about the classification of broadband internet and access service is in fact a rule subject to the CRA. So the, the idea or the, the, the myth, if you will, that the Congressional Review Act will restore net neutrality, whatever that means, uh, my, I would submit to you that it will not uh, resuscitate the rules that the FCC rescinded in 2017, and it will not result in the reclassification of broadband internet access service to a telecommunication service. So, so Ben, why can't, Congress just say, we mean by this CRA to do exactly that, to roll back the, to the 2015 rules. Can't, can't they include some legislative history within the CRA to do that? No, they're, 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 they can absolutely determine that, that they could classify broadband internet access service as a legislative matter, but that would require they exercise their Article I powers to actually enact legislation. So they could, like as, as I think Grace and Larry are going to talk about if there were a legislative mechanism by which Congress can determine, you know, this is subject to Title I, this is subject to Title II, here's the authority that the FCC has or doesn't have, it can absolutely do that. But that is not the mechanism of the Congressional Review Act. It is, in fact, a blunt instrument that says the agency did it wrong and it can't do it again. And, and most critically, the one detail we haven't explained here yet is that the CRA covers an entire document. There's no way to apply the CRA um, more specifically within a document. That's it. So the order that we're talking about here would be reversed in its entirety insofar as it contains rules. All the rules get reversed, the order parts do not. And, and the last thing before we move on to legislation, um, this is not just our theory. There is a clear DC Circuit decision on what constitutes an order and what constitutes a rule in the context of Title II classification. Now, it's not about the CRA, but it's exactly the same issue under the Administrative Procedure Act. And that decision is in our letter. It's Quest Services Corp. v. FCC, where a seller of prepaid cards challenged the FCC's declaratory ruling that its service was a telecommunications service, saying that the company shouldn't retroactively be subject to all of the universal service fund charges. And the DC Circuit said no. Uh, the order is, uh, is clearly an adjudicatory order. That's it. We already know what classification is. This is not hard. There is no legal analysis on the other side. So I just implore all of you who want to resolve this issue to just realize that this, the CRA is purely being used as a political tool, and it is a distraction. If you really care about resolving this issue, you need to let go of that and move on to legislative solution of this issue. Barry, if, if, if Congress is able to essentially conflate rules and orders, for example, would that then allow Congress to use the CRA to, say, overturn a merger um, that was approved by the FCC or, or some other government agency? Well, f f fortunately, the CRA um, does make clear that any, um, 
any document of particular applicability is not subject to the CRA. So that's, a, that's another clarification. So the confusion that I'm talking about here that could result is it's not going to be <coughs> things like that, because that, that at least is, is much more clear in the text of the CRA. But, but think about this example where in the Quest case, you had someone saying, hey, we shouldn't have been paying all those universal service fees. We want a refund. Or they didn't pay, and the FCC was trying to make them pay. That's the kind of thing that, that we're, we're talking about opening the door to. Now, there's one piece we haven't talked about here. I, I said earlier that I think the courts will stop that confusion, ultimately. But everything takes a long time in the courts, as everyone here knows. And it's going to take an even longer time here, because there is a provision in the CRA uh, discussing judicial review saying that um, certain aspects of, this, of what happens under the CRA are not subject to judicial review. Some people have taken that to mean that nothing that happens under the CRA is subject to, to judicial review. I don't think that's what that provision means. I think that's specifically referring to the, uh, the internal procedures in Congress. So you can't challenge the vote or the mechanism or the timing or that sort of thing. But there's just no way that um, Congress in that particular part of the CRA could stop the courts from eff effectively enforcing what is a line between Article I, legislative functions, and Article III. Again, this <coughs> distinction here is not just an artifact of the CRA. That's a, a reflection of that constitutional separation of powers. So, so given the fact that we're dealing with the telecom industry, and, and some of us have been practicing in that area for many, many years, the one thing we know about the telecom industry is they will litigate. Um, so if the CRA were to pass, we're facing litigation, right? Yeah, and it's not just me, the telecom industry. Just for what it's worth, um, Tech Freedom has been an intervener in the challenge up at the Supreme Court. We represent zero telecom companies. Our fellow interveners are small entrepreneurs who are engaged in VoIP service and who are concerned that the 2015 reinterpretation of Title II, and especially the reinterpretation of what constitutes a, 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 a mobile uh, data service uh, covered by Title II, that that opened the door to the FCC regulating not just broadband under Title II, but in fact, essentially any service that uses an IP address, as certainly all of those uh, voice over internet protocol services do. So there will be litigation on this, and it's not just big telecom. So any handicapping on whether or not this is going to make it through the House? Any thoughts, Grace? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fair. Uh, having been a creature of the House. Uh, <coughs> so. Recovering creature of the House. <laughs> Recovering creature of the House. Um, uh, yeah, um, I mean, first of all, I would like to just argue that the Senate did not do its job and stop the CRA from coming over to the House. <laughs> of course, now the House has to take it on again. Um, I'd like to, uh, I think, you know, conventional wisdom is that with a Republican majority, it's very unlikely that it will make its way through the House, but, um, you know, it is an election year and things are the way they are, and you just don't know. So, um, generally speaking, I do think that it's, uh, it's highly unlikely, but you know, unlikely things have happened before. <laughs> can, can I just jump in? Actually, I, I just want to ask some questions. Um, because we were talking about this before, so Vanda, can you tell us how long do they have to, to take a vote? Um, and in, in the set of circumstances that you guys were just describing where uh, a CRA passes, there's no case law, uh, courts may refuse to take judicial review, um, who would decide what part of the 400-page order was actually disapproved and, and what part wasn't if, if the courts refuse it? Um, that, how, how do we know? <laughs> I'll take the first part because that's the easy part. Um, the, the answer is, and this is actually very hard to figure out because the CRA does not make this clear, but I spent a lot of time looking at this and the CRS has, has also reached this conclusion. The, um, as I said, if, if, if there's no vote before June 11th, the repo goes into effect. But the House can vote up until the end of this Congress because that resolution is still valid before the Congress. So in principle, this vote could happen all the way up um, through January 3rd. So we've heard about a 60-day shot clock. Baron, so you're saying that only applies? It doesn't apply for the House. It does not apply for the House. So the, the shot clock, this is confusing. The, the shot clock is really about the introduction of the resolution. I, this is the single most arcane thing that I've ever had to work out about uh, Hill procedure. 
Um, but uh, again, I can send you the CRS report. The CRS has also reached the same conclusion. And I think it matters politically to your question, Jim, because let's be honest about this. This is uh, purely an electoral issue. So uh, Democrats have no incentive to force a vote. They would love to drag this through um, the midterms because the whole point here is to beat up on Republicans. So that, that's my prediction. And I wish I were so sanguine about this, but I actually uh, suspect that you will see a number of um, House Republicans uh, defect on this because nobody understands the issue. Um, people don't care, clearly. No one in the Senate cared about this question. No one's done a, a requested GAO letter yet. Congress literally has no idea what it's doing. And on the other hand, the subject we'll discuss next about how to do substantive legislation is, you know, is very daunting. And the politics of this are now poisonous, where once it was perhaps we were close multiple times to getting a legislative deal done, 2006, the House passed legislation that would have given the FCC authority to enforce 2015, the um, 2005 Open Internet Policy Statement. That was a Republican bill. Democrats wanted a deal in 2010. Republicans offered a deal in 2014. We keep missing the boat, and it just keeps getting harder. So I think we've set the stage that this is going to be more like a sledgehammer on a watermelon than, than, than dental floss. So let's turn over to what should Congress be doing, and, and what are the avenues towards substantive um, legislation? Larry, Grace, can you, you want to dig down a little bit into what Barron talked about in terms of where people come to the table and why people are walking away from the table and where's the table at this point? Do you, you want to go? Okay. Well, I, so I can I can start as the uh, as the junior member of the, <laughs> the panel uh, on these on these issues. So I mean, the answer to your question, Jim, um, depends really on what it is people want to achieve, and I think this. This has really been the problem all along, is um, you have sort of a, a public explanation of what net neutrality advocates want, which is the rules, uh, no blocking, no throttling, no paid prioritization, no unreasonable discrimination. Um, and then you have what they also want, which is reclassification of broadband as a, as a Title II service. Um, as soon as you try to separate the two, that's when things get messy. Uh, so we had, uh, and I don't know how far, far back it has been, I can't go back to, to the 2005 legislation you mentioned, but I do go back to the, to the 2010 legislation that was introduced by Congressman Waxman, um, which was itself uh, based on a, uh, a framework that was worked out by Google and Verizon uh, in hopes of avoiding that next series of, of FCC uh, actions that, that didn't work. Um, that bill was, uh, was circulated, it was never introduced, uh, it was uh, rejected by the advocates as being fake net neutrality, uh, largely because, uh, at least on the paper, because it excluded uh, wireless uh, broadband from the rules, um, but because it also did not reclassify broadband as a Title II service. So we went back to the FCC. We had the, the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the 2010 version of the rules that got thrown out by the courts. We went back. We had the 2015 version of the court of, of the rules. And prior to the 2015 vote, then there was a second piece of major legislation. There have been several pieces of legislation, but I'm just going to talk about the major ones. The second piece of major legislation, which was uh, introduced by um, Senators Dinnan and Congressman uh, Walden and Upton, um, that was uh, a bill that, again, laid out the rules, uh, literally this, almost the exact same language as had been in the 2010 version of the FCC's order, as far as the, the terminology of the, the, the blocking and, and so on, the rules themselves, uh, it, did not, uh, it, it did not actually exclude wireless. It, left, it said wireless was fully covered by, the, uh, by the, these new rules. Um, and uh, for all intents and purposes, I think it was about an eight-page bill um, that would have effectively uh, put into place the, the 2010 version of the FCC's version of the rules, uh, but also would have clarified that, that uh, broadband was not to be reclassified as Title II now or in the future. Uh, and so that killed it. Uh, that, the, the, that, that provision said, well, you know, the, the advocates said, well, we don't, you know, again, what we're really after here is reclassification. This bill takes that away even as a potential in the future. And so there was no negotiation. There was no discussion, really, of that a piece of legislation. Uh, 
Senator Nelson in a hearing that I was testifying at on a totally different subject, uh, very candidly said, you know, this is definitely something we need to solve with legislation, but the politics are not ripe for that kind of discussion right now. That, of course, was in early 2015. Um, they've gotten much worse uh, since then for every, uh, every imaginable reason. Uh, and so that bill has, has not gone anywhere. And then last year, um, late last year, uh, Congressman Blackburn circulated uh, a, another version of legislation um, this one's similar to the Thune Upton Walden bill, uh, except that it uh, took away a specific uh, uh, prohibition on pay prioritization. Um, so it was, it was all of the 2010 rules minus one, uh, but also again said, you know, Title II is off the table permanently. And so, so far that bill has not had any activity either. Grace, your thoughts? Yeah, um, <clears throat> sorry about that. One of the other things that actually helped to kill, I think, the, the Upton bill um, was also uh, uh, there was this provision that basically prohibited the FCC from making any further rules based on 706. So if you recall, part of this whole uh, confusion mess is created by the fact that no one's really sure about what the FCC's jurisdiction is to set rules on internet services. Um, at, classified as Title I, they're lim uh, limited to ancillary um, to their ancillary authority, whereas if they had classified broadband as Title II, they would have much more authority to set rates, uh, arbitrate disputes, et cetera. So at the heart of that is, I think, a basic Republican-Democrat difference on what the role of the agency should be. And um, uh, uh, so one of the things that was included in that bill was the, the notion that the FCC could no longer use 706, which was questionable, I think, at first, as a basis for rulemaking authority. That, uh, I think, <laughs> Was it uh, was you know understandably uh, or ex expectedly a, uh, a a deal breaker I think for um, for coming to an agreement on that. Uh, I think what needs to happen though is um, and and this is also the, the the unclarity or the ambiguity of the SEC's uh, authority in this area is also what sort of has uh, continued to have this mess repeat on us as many times as it has. Repeating on us is fair, right? Yeah, and and Grace makes an important point, which is. There's a the, the even bigger, even the, the even bigger untold uh, or unclear story about this is that the Congress has not passed significant regulation related to this industry since 1996. Right. Um, those of you who can think back that far, um, broadband was not what it is today. The internet was not what it is today. Uh, there are very few references to the internet in the 96 Act. Um, uh, some of the ones that are in there were remarkably you know, far-reaching in, in, in a good way in terms of things like Section 230, uh, in terms of the foresight Congress had. But uh, I, I don't think anybody would imagine that in 1996, Congress really mad, knew what the internet would become 10 years later and, and on. Uh, and so, as Grace says, there's great uncertainty as to what the FCC's authority here is, and what Congress wanted it to be. The reality is Congress hadn't said, because wasn't really important, right. or it wasn't as important in 1996 as certainly as it is today. But there are, been, there didn't been, Congress say something about the fact, basically hands off the internet in the 96 Act? Yeah, there was a declaratory statement that the policy of the United States was that the internet should be kept unfettered from federal or state uh, regulation. So that leads us to the second sort of big divide between Republicans and Democrats in coming to an agreement here. And I don't mean to just point out the differences, I promise you, I, I will point out, uh, point out some great areas of agreement. Um, is, the, uh, is, the, uh, is broadband a utility versus a service? Uh, I think is where a lot of, I think, uh, distinction is. And people don't think of it necessarily in those terms, but, <clears throat> uh, but is, is broadband so important that you have to regulate it in the same way that you have to regulate electricity, water, um, and telephone service, or is it, um, um, uh, and, and let's point out the differences between utilities. Utilities get different rates of return on their investment. Utilities get uh, a different treatment by investors, you, uh, whereas private services like um, uh, the cable services or whatever else uh, get different types of private investment because they are able to uh, show return in a way that's uh, perhaps more aggressive than a, a typical utility has. So that is the question. And then when you talk about basically creating something that is a utility, and this is where it gets, this is now where fully into you know, uh, present day, what else becomes a utility? <clears throat> Which 
which is where I think you're hearing a lot of the other discussions now about regulating platforms and large-scale tech platforms. So when do you start? Uh, so there is a question as to where you draw that line. When does something become a utility and when does something become uh, so necessary that you're able to subject it to re regulations that are as onerous as utility scale regulation. So there is, uh, I think, a fundamental disagreement on where you draw that line. Um, uh, and, uh, well, and, and that line varies all down the spectrum. Do you think that's a fair assessment? Yeah, I mean, I think if, if now the debate expands to, to platforms, um, and certainly you know some of the, the hearings that we've had recently with Mark Zuckerberg and so on, suggest that you know there's a, there's a, an appetite, I don't know how strong an appetite, but there's an appetite now for thinking even more broadly about these questions of what is the internet, how should it be regulated, and by whom, um, then now it's not just the rest of our lifetimes, it's your grandchildren's uh, lifetimes uh, before this, uh, this gets resolved. I was also gonna say, you know, we've had periodically uh, discussions, certainly in the last 10 years, about a you know, major or, or even minor reform of the Communications Act Post 1996, uh, there, there certainly at least a couple of years ago, there was an effort in the House. Uh, lots of position papers were written. You know, there seems to be some some motion there, but it it died, um, and I don't think there's anything going on right right now. So, um, if, if we're talking about you know, little net neutrality versus the Communications Act versus all of the internet, those are sort of the concentric circles of of, of importance. Um, uh, we can't even start a conversation about net neutrality legislation, which, as I say, should only be eight pages long. But imagining the Communications Act and imagining a broader Communications Act that encompasses all the internet services, uh, it, it seems like you know that's that's full employment for several generations. So, so Baron, what's so bad about utility regulation? Yeah, many people in the audience may be wondering why we haven't talked yet about the details of net neutrality and how those should be codified. Well, that, that's because the fundamental debate is not about that. There is broad agreement on the core of that issue, despite some Republicans who don't understand that. Um, the debate is really about the FCC's authority, and then on the margins, and the ways in which the term net neutrality has been expanded far beyond what Tim Wu meant it to mean. So, so let me speak up for Democrats for just a minute on the first point. I want to give you three historical moments in which uh, I think Democrats understood this very well and probably better than Republicans. And the first is 93-94. The Clinton administration, when they started what became the 96 Telecom Act, they understood this problem that having technological silos in the way such as uh, the, the Communications Act had, had divided the world of broadcasting, uh, Title III, uh, the world of telephone network, Title II, and then eventually uh, Title VI for, for cable, they understood that was crazy and that didn't make sense anymore. And their vision for how the Communications Act should be written was very forward-looking. They were gonna have another title that, is, that these services, these converging services would, would over time be put into. And unfortunately that didn't happen. The 96 Act, um, with the notable exception of, of uh, Section 230, which was frankly, was drafted by, by smarter, more forward-looking people and then stuck onto the Telecom Act. The 96 Act just continued the same mistake that Congress had been making for decades of drawing those artificial lines. And I think it's fair to say that the core of the 96 Act did not anticipate the internet at all. It was obsolete well before it was finally passed. The Clinton administration approach was the right one. If you, if you hear, I uh, used to hear Bill Nelson uh, talking about having another title to the act. He's talking about that Democrat idea from the early 90s. That's the first moment. Second moment was uh, Bill Kennard, the chairman of the FCC, after the 96 Act was passed. He understood what the Democrats had been trying to do, but he had this mess to deal with of what is Title I and what's a Title II service, and it not being exactly clear. And it's very clear what he thought. He said, look, I've been there in the, in the, the uh, telephone world, and, um, and we have to make a decision. If there's a hope of facilitating, I'm quoting him, a, a, a market-based solution here, meaning for, for broadband and broadband deployment to everyone, we should do it because the alternative uh, is to go to the telephone world, Title II, a world we are, where we are trying to deregulate, we're trying to go back from that. And then this is the key part, and just pick up this whole morass of regulation and dump it wholesale onto the cable pipe. Right? That is not good for America. He understood that very clearly. It's crystal clear if you look at, at that, 
and the reports the SEC put out in the late 90s, that he was going to do precisely the same thing that the Republican FCC ended up doing, which was to say broadband services are not subject to Title II. And then the third moment is, so then fast forward, Republicans make a mess of this. So Kevin, Michael Powell, you know, who gave a speech in 2004 as uh, laying out the four freedoms, right? He got this, articulated the broad bipartisan agreement. Kevin Martin, the second FCC chairman under Bush and the worst FCC chairman of my lifetime, ruined this issue. The Federal he Trade Commission. Highly of you. <laughs> <laughs> the Federal Trade Commission was ready and able to deal with the issue of the Comcast BitTorrent case. Kevin Martin insisted that his agency was going to decide. That set us down the road for the last 10 years of litigation. Um, and it, it created this situation in 2010 where Republicans, uh, having done this, um, the issue then became what legislation should look like. And as already has been noted, uh, Henry Waxman had a bill, the chairman, Julius Janikowski, wanted a, a, a bill done. And the FCC came up with their original proposal to, to deal with the Title II. Right? They said we could do maybe a Title II light. And they understood at the time, congressional Democrats, most notably, Congressional Black Caucus, I think to a member, all of them understood, just as Bill Kennard understood, that that would be a bad thing for America because that sort of Title II regulation, that, that threat of price controls, which is something that Chuck Schumer just acknowledged that, that he wants, something that public knowledge has been saying for years, that that would discourage uh, investment and deployment, right? And so at that point, this is the last point I make, that idea of Title II light that was thrown out by the FCC in 2010, that was rejected because people understood then that you can't really have Title II light. You can't be a little bit pregnant. You have Title II or nothing. And this is so important to this debate because some people today will say, yeah, yeah, but we're not talking about all of Title II. We're just talking about uh, you know the core of it just to do net neutrality. Bullshit. <laughs> Title II, the core of Title II was invoked by the FCC in 2015. That is 201B, no un, uh, uh, unjust or unreasonable practices, 202A, no uh, unreasonable discrimination. That is railroad regulation from 1887. That is on the table today until June 11th. That's what we're talking about. And the opportunity here in legislation is take that off the table, give the FCC appropriately defined authority, but not a blank check to regulate the internet. That's what Title II is. That's what the FCC's 2010 reinterpretation of Section 76 is. So that's why the, the contour for any legislative deal is taking those two things off the table and then giving the FCC the appropriately targeted authority to deal with net neutrality. Right. Yeah, I just want to, because I think Baron and Grace have both raised a very important point. Remember how the 2015 order was couched when it talked about Title II. The only reason the FCC, they said, was relying on Title II was to provide the requisite legal authority for the rules. That was it. Well, we now know that wasn't true. That was not the purpose of Title II, because now if that were true, Congress could enact, as Grace and Larry and, and Barron said, we could enact net neutrality rules probably tomorrow, because if we just need legislative authority for the FCC to, to, to have some authority over net neutrality, Congress could give them that by enacting net neutrality legislation. That's not what this debate about. This debate is about the extent to which People believe the FCC should regulate broadband internet access providers either as traditional utilities, as Grace has indicated, or as something else. This is all about, in my view, uh, the FCC's, the, the proper role of the FCC as it relates to the internet economy. When I started with Bell South, uh, we were under rate of return regulation in 1995. I have lived with uh, traditional utility regulation when I started my career. If you want to look for examples of uh, where innovation uh, is uh, embraced, don't look to the telephone companies of the, of the 1990s. How many pages of regulations? Yeah. Caller ID was our idea of a really innovative service. I mean, we, that's, not what, that's not what utilities do. They don't, the gas company doesn't innovate, the water company doesn't innovate. They provide a service and that's all you want them to do. Is that what we want broadband providers to do? Just be like a dumb pipe, like the gas and the water. That's the debate, and we ought to acknowledge that. And we ought to have a candid conversation about what the right role of, not only when it comes to innovation, but competition. The reason the gas company and the water company are regulated as utilities is because there's only one of them, for the most part. 
you don't have competition in gas and water. You don't want competition. You want, do we want competition in broadband? Who doesn't think that? The answer to that is yes. And well, that, that's what Bill Kennard is talking about. Right, and, and that's yeah. what title, title II and traditional utility regulations is antithetical to competition, which is why when Congress opened up markets, they specifically wanted the FCC to back off its traditional utility regulation because they knew competition was the goal, and competition will regulate, not regulators. So where do we go from here? Um, you know, is it possible to find common ground politically, or are we just simply going to keep spinning around? And if nothing happens in Congress, um, plus or minus the CRA, and there's a change in administration in 2020, what happens then? Do we go back to a Democrat-led FCC that just flips this, the bit again the other way? Yeah, I, I think so, um, unfortunately. I mean, I think that was the assumption, uh, you know, in 2015 when the, the, the choice was between the Thune-Upton-Walden bill or some variation of it. Sorry, I should say the, the Upton-Walden-Thune bill mm -hmm. in deference to Grace. And where you are. The House bill. Um, uh, we had the choice between that bill or, or some negotiation about it or the 2015 order, which effectively you know, took the nuclear option of, of reclassifying back to, uh, to, to uh, Title II, or sorry, to Title II. Um, and I think that the gamble was uh, by the folks uh, in, in the, the White House who were pushing for this was, uh, we're gonna win the election in 2016. Next FCC chair will be uh, sympathetic to this and we won't have to worry about it. Uh, obviously, that's not what happened. Um, and uh, the way in which the, the 2015 order was written and the way in which it was argued successfully for the DC Circuit was effectively that the FCC had extremely wide, if not unbridled, discretion to decide how to classify and when to change their mind about reclassification. Um, that case is still now pending at the US Supreme Court, uh, whether or not that's the case. But at least the, the panel of the, of the DC Circuit said, yes, you have very wide discretion FCC. So not surprisingly, when the new FCC came in, they said, right, we have wide discretion to decide how to classify. We are now going to say the other version. We're going to go back to reclassifying, re-reclassifying, unreclassifying, back to, to Title I. Um, that is being challenged in court. But now we have a very strong precedent, the 2015 case, uh, that said, nope, you, you argued last time that they have very wide discretion we agreed with you, guess what? That wide discretion now applies the other way. Um, so until we get a legislative solution now, we really are now caught in you know, what computer scientists would call an infinite um, This just goes back and forth. I mean, we've already had however many reversals, depending on how you count it, up to 10 reversals in the last 10 years of policy on net neutrality. Now we've kind of institutionalized that. Um, it will just be going back and forth between chair and, you know, there may be some differences within the same parties, FCC chairs, but there's nothing now that stops the FCC from willfully changing its mind anytime it wants to. When, when Larry says we've institutionalized this, just think about what that means. We've institutionalized it in that there is now a cottage industry of people who love fighting about this. Well, let me tell you, I don't. I have other things to do with my life. <laughs> Seriously, I would much rather work on any number of other issues. And unfortunately, there are a lot of organizations in this town uh, and activist groups that just love fighting about this. Their budgets have ballooned. This is a great issue for them. And, and it's a great issue for Democrats. Democrats love fighting about it. But if they actually want to resolve this issue and, and provide the certainty that they claim they want, the only way to do that is legislation. Grace, any common ground that you can find? I did promise that, didn't I? <laughs> so, uh, real quick, uh, if, uh, yes, please legislate, for God's sake, please <laughs> legislate. Uh, think of the incredible, I think, power that you have here in, in Congress. Uh, you don't have to stick with the rules that actually exist today. So, um, and my recommendation is, and, and maybe I'm being optimistic or uh, about finding some way to get forward, go forward on this, but if you are going to move forward on this, it cannot be simply a set of no blocking, no throttling, an eight-page bill. It is going to have to find the FCC's jurisdiction vis-a-vis -vis the internet. You're gonna have to figure out how, how that works, and that's going to include things like privacy and interconnection. 
Um, these are, you're gonna have to go down in the details, and I'm always happy to talk to you, uh, I think any one of us is always happy to talk to you about how these, how the details work, um, and uh, I obviously take off our client hats or whatever else to do that, so please. Like I said, for God's sake, please legislate. <laughs> um, and then second, um, you're also gonna have to figure out who is covered under the, this particular, um, uh, the, the, this new uh, legislation that you put together. Because the, the question about utility style regulation on a certain level is about who is gonna pay for that service, right? It is not just about um, you know, uh, onerous regulations on a bunch of incumbents, it is actually also about who pays. So, you take electricity, uh, for example, as sort of a platform service or a general purpose service, uh, the, the electric guys are basically put in the money to basically put the, the grid together. Uh, but there are thousands and thousands of other ecosystems that benefit from that, that platform. Who's gonna pay for the, so, but we've decided that, utili that the electricity is a utility and the electric uh, and the uh, public sector will pay for, for provisioning that grid. Do we have a system now where we basically want a utility staff system for broadband? Uh, obviously my position in the past has been no, and my position today is no. I think there's a huge ecosystem that benefits in a huge way that I think we all, um, uh, that, that can actually contribute to the, the, the investments in uh, broadband, uh, broadband util uh, infrastructure. So I think that there's a way for you to think about, you know, what kind of regulation makes sense, what kind of, I think, uh, funding system makes sense for uh, for these kinds of things. So again, um, oh, did I, uh, please legislate. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but uh, I think, if, you know, there's no disagreement, the common ground that I did want to talk to is that there's no disagreement, it's that you know, blocking the throttle and transparency, no discrimination, all makes sense. Uh, let's figure out how to get there. And I, I think that that's where we are. We're all happy to help you guys get there. I, I just, okay. just want to note, um, in many ways, Grace said the key words today that um, Title II is a system of, of price controls. It's about who pays. The particular version, the particular application that Democrats have said they want is a system where uh, edge providers pay nothing. But that's just one application, right? So if you, if you wanted to, the FCC could say the opposite. Could say, yeah, you know what? Google, Facebook, Amazon, especially Amazon, that Jeff Bezos said he's going to pay, right? We already have a president who rants and raves about making Amazon pay more at the U.S. Postal Service. Title II would give the FCC exactly that ability. And this is not a fantasy that I'm making up. This is what the European carriers demanded, what was it, five, six years ago. They were asking for precisely this, to treat broadband providers as essentially common carriers under European law, um, and to make edge companies pay for the carriage of traffic. So you really don't want a Republican FCC to have Title II powers. You really want to take that off the table. And I would just close by giving you one very quick example. My former think tank, the Progress and Freedom Foundation, studied exactly this problem. It brought together people from across the political spectrum, mostly Democrats. If you look at the group that signed on to that, it was mostly people who would have been in the Hillary FCC. They produced the Digital Age Communications Act, a recommendation, and then there was legislation introduced, and it dealt with the core of this problem, which was Democrats always saying, yeah, yeah, but, but the FCC needs to have broad authority, and Republicans saying, yeah, yeah, but we need to constrain their discretion. And the answer was, yeah, give them broad authority, tear down all the silos, let them regulate, but ensure that they have to justify their decisions. And that got people on board like Howard Shalansky, who was President Obama's chief regulatory czar. There are solutions like that that are more outside the box. If you don't want to go for the narrow solution of the Thune Upton bill, people don't really have the appetite for really thinking carefully. Great. Well, we've come, uh, it's about 10.30. We'd like to leave a little bit of time for questions if people um, have them. And I don't know if we have a mic or not, but uh, if you just speak up, I think that will, that will suffice. Question here, yes. Yes, yeah, so very, first of all, it's very informative. Thank you very much for speaking today. Uh, secondly, you mentioned there's an election year coming up and how that may uh, possibly change members' votes uh, on the net neutrality issue. But I believe net neutrality is, seems to be sort of a loaded term. And so the PR battle, every single you know constituent um, that I deal with outside of the office 
is for net neutrality because it sounds like a great thing. And so, you know, Frank Lawrence taught a lot of us you have, you cannot argue on their terms. You can't let them dictate, um, you know, you can't let them frame the language. And so, my question is, uh, you know, what can we do to possibly rename this this fight? And um, and then also, um, you know, what is your answer to critics that say that small businesses are going to get um, taken out of the market by big chip players, or that people are going to lose internet access? You want to take that first? Well, I, I, the net neutrality issue has always frustrated me because who, who can be against neutrality? It doesn't mean that, that, that nobody. Uh, but the, the reality is that this is really not about you know access to the internet. I mean, the companies are not sp spending the billions of dollars that they are on their mobile and fixed networks to deny access to the internet. What this really is is this is about the proper role of government in regulating the internet, uh, and it always has been. Um, and that's why the principles that that uh, Chairman Powell articulated in in, in 2005 were, you know, not controversial, particularly among the industry, which is, yeah, we, we agree with those things. But it's it's the role, it, it's what kind of oversight you have to live with. And that's that's why I, I frame this debate as a, one of, of government authority. To, the, to, the, uh, to, your, to your other question about, you know, kind of how to, how to deal with this issue, um, you know, from, from kind of a political standpoint, I mean, the, you know, the, the challenge, I think, for, for the industry is that, you know, we, we would love to have certainty. And when, when people talk about why I can't get broadband in my location or why my coverage doesn't work at this particular time, you know, the, the, no company is going to spend the billions of dollars to deploy their network infrastructure unless they have some certainty. And, and this is this current situation that Grace alluded to, and Larry talked about this. Where you know we're subject to the women caprice of, of who happens to be in power, is not conducive to uh, any company spending money. And <clears throat> small guys should be more concerned about having ubiquitous networks than they should be about you know AT and T or Verizon or Comcast saying I'm not going to let you on my network if you don't pay. I mean, I've never understood the business model that would make that a viable alternative. I mean, broadband providers make money by being a, having customers being able to go wherever they want to go. And if you can't get Netflix or you can't get the, the, the competitor in Netflix, you're probably not going to use that broadband provider uh, because it doesn't meet your needs. And so I, I don't, having worked for a broadband provider, I don't, I don't, I never, I never heard anybody talk in those terms. They've always talked in terms of we want to have as many people on our network as possible because that's the only way we make money. Um, you, again, Chuck Schumer is talking about price regulation. That's what Title II means. Um, look, the, this problem, the fundamental problem here is the term net neutrality because everything gets swept into that. You have the core of the term, the thing Tim Wu was talking about. You have the way in which it's expanded. And then you have the issue of the FCC's authority. Everything's just net neutrality. And it, it's, it's problematic both for Democrats and Republicans because I, I believe that um, you would have seen a Republican bill already through the House. You would have seen the Senate do its work already, except that there are Republican members who don't understand that, that they can be for resolving this issue, for the four freedoms that Michael Powell uh, was in favor of, and in that particular sense, for net neutrality, and be against giving the FCC a blank check to regulate the internet. And, and so that, that explains the conundrum that we're in, that you have in action, you had this great discussion draft that Grace worked on that was introduced by her bosses that didn't go anywhere. Now that's in part because they were waiting, in principle part, they were waiting for Democrats. They thought they could get Democrats to come to the table. Well, it should be clear by now that's not gonna happen. And yet, I was hoping you would have seen at least Republicans this year say, fine, we're just gonna move our own legislation We'll put it through, we're gonna vote on it, just like happened in 2006. And that hasn't happened in significant part because they can't count on all the Republicans, especially in the Senate. Because you have people like, you know, Ted Cruz is out there saying that net neutrality is Obamacare for the internet. It's not. Title II, if you will, is Obamacare for the internet, I guess. That's a, you could make that argument, but please, Republicans, stop attacking net neutrality and focus on the problem. And one thing I would add for you know, your members, constituents, have them pull out their, their cable bill, okay? Right now, they're paying almost 19% tax on cable and on telephone, but not on their internet access. 
If you have Title II reg regulation, all the FCC has to do is flip one switch and, and all your constituents are now paying almost a 19% tax on their internet access. Which hasn't happened because Democrats are waiting until after Hillary won to do that. Yes. <laughs> so that's really one of, one of the cores. I mean, it, it, it's a dollars and cents to constituents. Um, and that's, I mean, the USF contribution of 19% tax is the single most regressive tax, maybe other than gasoline taxes, we have in this country. Because literally anybody who is not a Lifeline subscriber has to pay that, which means if you're just over the poverty line, just can afford to, to, to have internet access, boom, you could get hit with a almost 20% tax uh, on, that, on that bill. That's dollars and cents out of people's pockets. And that's what Title II inexorably leads to. It has to. That's another question. Mm -hmm. You've talked about the rules versus order and, and what the CRA will in fact. So of the 2015 order, as they always talk about it, how much are rules, how much is an order? Was, is it one or the other? So, so the question, just so we have further recording, is how much of the 2015 <laughs> order represented a rule versus an order? Yeah, so the, the, it was actually styled declaratory ruling order and further notice, if I recall. Um, the, 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 what I would say is that the, the, the order part of the, of the document was the reclassification decision because that was the declaratory ruling and adjudication. The rules, and they were, they were beyond transparency, uh, they you know, adopted modified complaint, they got rid of their complaint procedures, they made some other tweaks to their, their rules. So there were other things if you actually look at attachment A to the order that are styled as rules. And that's what I would say is, is affected by the CRA, and that's it. The, the specific substantive obligations that were adopted as modifications to Title 47 of the Congressional the CFR. Well, just, just technically, if you look at those documents, the stuff that is rule, the, the, the things that are rules are all of the rules in the appendix at the end, plus the language in the order that is effectively giving guidance on those, right? That's like what the CFPB did. In, in that sense, the CRA is very expansive. Things that are of a rule nature, whether or not they are formalized as rules, are, are covered. But as Bennett says, the, um, the, the things that are ultimately um, orders as, in, as interpretations of the statute and have retroactive effect, those are clearly orders. And then the reason you know is just, just think about this, and we talked about this in our letter. D does anyone actually imagine that in um, 2015, when the FCC had said that broadband was a Title II service, if there had been um, something that had happened right in that interim period, right be before the order went into effect, does anyone really think the FCC at that point wouldn't have, have gone after that provider, saying, you know, that was, subject, that was a Title II service, our rules were not in effect yet, but uh, we still have 201B power, and it's always been a Title II service. Obviously, they would have gone after it. They could have, because it was retroactive, because it was an interpretation of what was subject to Title II. That's how you know it was an order, and not a rule, because rules are inherently about going forward, how we're going to exercise our legislative uh, function in, in, in applying the, the statute that Congress gave us. Yeah, if you, if you had the misfortune of reading the entire, about 400 pages of the 2015 order, not the majority of it, the, the, the thing that had the most number of pages was uh, all the gymnastics around forbearance from the parts of Title II that were not going to be applied uh, to, to broadband internet service providers. Uh, uh, and um, as, as I've noted many times, the phrase at this time or for now uh, was used each time they forbear, forbore, it's a terrible word, um, <laughs> from any particular provision of Title II, but the, the bulk, not the bulk, the most, the plurality of the 2015 order was about forbearance for now, at this time, from, uh, from the bulk of, of uh, Title II. There's 70 some times, was it? And, and, and for now, at this time, that, that's just another way of saying we're exercising our discretion to pick and choose. That, that, that's a, a rulemaking function. That's not a, what does the statute mean in an adjudicatory sense. Question over here. Uh, thank you all, once again, for doing this, it's fantastic. Um, it's great to talk a lot about uh, bipartisan agreement, and obviously things like public blocking, throttling, um, things of that nature are gonna receive a lot of bipartisan support. Um, one of the things uh, after June 11th is that the FCC is still gonna be kind of the top on the beach policing anti-competitive behavior. Uh, one of the policy disagreements that I've seen is uh, with the FCC's uh, its ex ante regulatory approach and the F FCC's uh, ex post. Can you talk a little bit about the differences between the two and um, a correlate solution going forward? What do you all prefer 
do want to emphasize that bipartisan agreement on this issue would be very helpful, especially when you're legislating and moving forward. So, yeah, I, I think that the approach that, um, that edu uh, the chairman took is uh, was pretty intelligent, actually. I think this is a, probably a very um, uh, Republican approach to basically look for the harm first and then uh, remedy afterwards. And I think that that, that is something that, that works well, <clears throat> considering that we, uh, as Republicans, I think many feel that the evidence for net neutrality harm is not there and, and does not uh, warrant the heavy handed Title II approach. That being said, I think there is some merit to basically having bright line rules that do sort of set the um, environment for investment so that you know what to expect and you know what the rules are ahead of time. I think there can be, um, as to whether or not, I think there are, there are merits to both approaches. So I think that basically when you come to a point where you are trying to put together legislation on this particular issue, I think uh, a certain level of bright line uh, rules to set the, set the right uh, uh, environment for investment is helpful. And then I think figuring out how to work this out. Generally speaking, I do think that um, ex post uh, action is probably better because you are able to find harms before and, and then remedy those specific harms. So you have less government intervention. But that is a talking primarily from just a theoretical standpoint or a principle standpoint. I, I don't really have any hard evidence really to back that up at this point. So uh, maybe if my colleagues who are much smarter and more versed than me can actually. I don't know about the smarter part, but I, the, the, what I would say is that the, the challenge with prescribing regulations in this space is that the space is constantly changing and evolving. So, you know, take sponsored data, which you know, people get all worked up about. I mean, we don't know how all these things pan out. And when you adopt rules that say you can't do this, you're potentially preventing or prescribing conduct that actually might benefit somebody as it evolves. And so I think that's the challenge the FCC always has, has, has faced in the internet world, which is, technology outpaces regulation. So that's why I think the FTC approach is actually more helpful because it allows the FTC to study the problem and determine, now having looked at it, can we determine whether there was something deceptive, whether there's something anti-competitive going on, and can, can make decisions based on, based on that, rather than a predictive judgment that, in our view, this is really bad. Yeah, to, to, to Grace's point, I mean, the best evidence we've got is that between uh, the dawn of broadband in 2015, there were no enforceable net neutrality rules. Uh, obviously, free speech can come to an end, democracy can come to an end, people are not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the parade of horrors, uh, in large part because the FTC was on the job. Um, they, they were actively on the job, and of course they were also you know, waiting in the wings if things uh, got out of hand. Uh, ironically, of course, the 2015 order by redefining uh, broadband ISPs as a common carrier explicitly cut off the FTC's jurisdiction. Now the 2017 order restored that, um, and there were some court cases in California that questioned that, but now that's all been happily resolved, and it's clear that the FTC is back on the job. Um, the evidence that that works is that it worked. So when, when Tom Wheeler was asked how the general conduct standard would be applied, he said, we don't really know. We'll figure it out as we go. Now, now that's outrageous in some ways, but it's also understandable in another, right? It's true that you don't know what the, the issues are going to be. And this is where, again, I say that uh, Democrats rightly recognize that constraining uh, jurisdiction is a problem if you draw artificial lines. But Republicans are right to say that you also need to, to, to constrain discretion so the agency can't just do whatever it wants. And again, if you want the right answer, if anyone here is actually interested in the right answer, go back and read the Digital Age Communications Act. Yes, it was introduced by Jim DeMint, but it was actually a radically moderate bill. PFS mistake was getting it introduced just by DeMint. They should have had Democrats on board because it was drafted by Democrats. And Democrats agreed because it gave the FCC the ability to make rules where the FCC could show, by clear and convincing evidence, that marketplace competition was not adequate to, to deal with an issue. And a democratic a a agency could use that authority to, to deal with these problems, to make rules, but there was one more key detail in DACA. This is actually brilliant if you think about it, which is the sunset. So DACA said, yeah, you can make rules, but all the rules sunset after five years. You have to show that there's a, a, a reason. You have to actually look again, re-examine re the issue, and, and decide whether that rule still makes sense. And that was the way to future-proof Regulation that is to to this date the most dynamist 
most uh, potentially bipartisan compromise vehicle out there. Again, Digital Age Communications Act, we can't call it DACA anymore for <laughs> obvious <laughs> reasons, <laughs> unfortunately. But we could dream about it. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. One more. Okay, so you talked a little uh, specifically about the uncertainty and how that's going to kind of hurt uh, a lot of providers. Can you speak more specifically on the short term and long term? Do you see benefit in what you see possibly being hurt? Well, if the Congressional Review Act resolution passes and is enacted, I think, to, to Barron's point, there, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty as far as what, what the legal effect is. So if the industry truly believes that the only thing that, that is impacted is a transparency rule, they're going to stop, potentially, disclosing their network management practices. If they want to engage in paid prioritization, they can start doing it and not tell anybody about it because there's no transparency requirements. There's likely going to be litigation over that issue and there's likely to be litigation over whether the reclassification decision is impacted by the Congressional Review Act. So we're back into the cycle of rather than spending money on deploying uh, networks, we're going to spend money on lawyers, which for Grace and it's not necessarily the worst thing, but it's not really conducive, I think, to, to good public policy at the end of the day. Uh, and, and I just think we just we get caught in this uncertainty loop that uh, that endures to nobody's benefit. I, I just want to know, uh, I, I think not disclosing uh, your network management practices in some ways it would be a material omission that the Federal Trade Commission could address. I think it's actually a pretty good example why the FCC is much more powerful than people realize. Uh, but, but it's also true that you won't have the specific clarity of exactly what details you need to provide. You won't have standardized um, disclosures. And I think that's, that's bad for consumers. Uh, but the the uncertainty that we're going to have going forward if the CRA were to pass is really twofold. One, you have the, the, the existing current uncertainty about um, Title II. And, and go look at George Ford's study. He uh, traces the effects of, um, of Title II, not from 2015 on. It's not about net neutrality, really. It's about Title II, from when Title II was first floated in 2010. And he traces that over time and shows that there's a very significant effect of I believe he said something like 20% change in investment. Go back and look at the study. So one, you have that uh, out there. Two, you then have uncertainty about how all this litigation is going to, to be resolved. And, and I think that um, you know analysts uh, are pretty sharp. The markets um, listen. But when you have the majority, or excuse me, still minority leader of the United States Senate saying we want price controls, that really does shape investment expectations. That that represents. It's not just a legal shift in what's possible. It's a political shift in understanding that now, all of a sudden, broadband regulation and, and price controls and so on are now finally on the table politically in a way that, you know, at least Tom Wheeler said he didn't want that. And now that ship has sailed. And the other thing I, I would add is, is generally, you know, plus or minus, the more reg regulations you have, the more incumbents are able to deal with them and the, and the less innovation, the less startups you get in, into a market. I mean, you can go across just about any market, and, and the more heavily regulated it is, it's the hard, it, it's a raised barrier of entry for new startups and, and people trying to get into, into the market. And if we want to sort of just freeze the internet where it is today and say Facebook will always be Facebook and Google will always be Google, then fine, let's regulate the heck out of it. But that's what, what we'll get out of it. But if we want, you know, a future where Facebook may not exist, Google may not, may not exist, because they didn't exist all that long ago, then we've got to take a hard look as to how much we want to regulate the space. And, and on Jim's point, remember, uh, this is increasingly not just about broadband, right? It, it's not under the 2015 order. I mean, 2015 order opens the door to, to regulation of, of many services. But in addition to that legal possibility, we now, have, we now see this issue uh, metastasizing politically where Republicans, um, having been fighting about this for so long and having been on the losing end for so long uh, and having a political ax to grind, um, are now starting to say, you know what? Let's use this whole thing as a weapon against Google and Facebook and Amazon and so on. And that is starting to be, I think, reflected in long-term expectations because people understand that if this debate is not resolved, that, that the potential solution of this debate, whether it's through FCC action or through uh, legislation or executive fiat is to start using these uh, tools and this rhetoric against big internet companies, which of course, as Jim notes, has the ironic consequence of protecting Google and Facebook and Amazon from competition from, from startups. 
It doesn't mean that uh, you're not going to hear that from um, from people who are now ranting and raving about the fairness doctrine. I just want to note this: that you know, for for 50 years, Republicans have been against the fairness doctrine. All of a sudden, now they're screaming about the unfairness of uh, of internet platforms. Right? This is a bad political <laughs> shift, and it's a sign that we're we're heading to away from that 1996 moment where Congress said the internet should be unfettered by regulation, where now, really honestly, what's determining what should and shouldn't be utility is not economics, it's political. It's pure political opportunism. We have to close the door on that. Any other questions? One more. Sorry, I have um, So blocking it broadly definitely has some bipartisan support. Bipartisation has some nuance to it. And, and often the examples we're giving uh, for prioritization um, telemedicine, autonomous vehicles, emergency services, but you wouldn't want those kind of services running on consumer broadband, right? That should be a, a specialized service, because, I mean, that's, you're almost talking about life and death. You don't want to trust the best efforts of consumer broadband. Is that an accurate assessment? Uh, I would say if we could have that discussion, it would be a wonderful discussion. And that's the discussion that we really need to have rather than all the other hoo-ha. Because I think you are absolutely right. Prioritization, I think, is the issue where it needs to get down to the weeds. And we need to really talk about, OK, which layer you know, uh, of the protocol do we, each of these services get to go on uh, to make sure that the emergency services get through and, and, and this and that? And, and how does it fit into it? And it's almost a technical question as much as it is a policy question. But that's exactly the discussions that we should be having, uh, that we can't have because every bit of air gets sucked out of the room in, in, in just defining what net neutrality is. Yeah. Look, it's, it's entirely a technical question. Um, and it's one that, that, that the legislation that I mentioned, the 2010 and the, you know, the, the Waxman bill, the upton Malden bill, Blackman bill, um, uh, all have a, a carve out, and also that the the FCC 2010 order and the 2015 order all had carve-outs for what are called specialized services. The problem is the specialized services run on the same infrastructure as the consumer uh, internet. And uh, as Jim says, you know, if we could just have the conversation about how to deal with that, uh, the balance was, I think, struck very well in all of the examples I just gave. But, and we're not gonna talk about state legislation because that's another conversation, but if you look at California SB 822, which just passed the California State Senate, uh, it completely obliterates that distinction and says no prioritization of any kind on any of the infrastructure that's used for the consumer internet. So no specialized services of any kind would be allowed under that bill. And I just want to echo the fact that Jim is absolutely right. These are the technical questions that you should be thinking about as you think about how to solve this problem. Um, and I just want to point out that the need is going to become more and more pressing as we move forward with 5G deployment because network slicing is going to be a huge part of dealing with that. So again, the nuances continue to multiply and proliferate. I think you know, figuring some sort of solution at this point would be very helpful. But you, you can have a prioritization in a commercial internet circumstance like in telemedicine. So if you're, if you're a patient at home who can't get to your doctor and you want to log on to a secure website to communicate with your doctor via the web, that's done, that would be done on a commercial internet basis. You certainly could have telemedicine applications that are dedicated connections between a hospital and a doctor, for example. But a lot of the applications and a lot of the, the interesting things that where telemedicine can actually be helpful would occur over the commercial internet. If you can't pay for something, you're going to get less of it. And the opportunity to have it may not exist at all. Now, perhaps you can do that through the specialized services category. But remember that the FCC's rules, as, as uh, Larry notes, they've always had that distinction. 2010 order, 2015 order. And really, it's again the question of the FCC's discretion. The agency has always been it's always clean, broad discretion in deciding where to draw that line. And you have some people, like our, our friends at Public Knowledge, um, who will say, uh, that look, go look at their, their blog post from a few years ago, where they, the title is something like, is cable a net neutrality violation? Not yet. And in other words, their answer was, yeah, fine, today it's a specialized service, but that could change in the future. And we may lobby the agency in the future to say that that is no longer a specialized service. That should be considered to be part of the broadband internet access service because it's just getting video which you can do on, on bias. So that's a yet another area in which we can't really trust the agency and it will inevitably be politicized. 
Well, with that, I want to uh, thank you all for sticking with us on this. I know this is a real deep dive and, in and the weeds and a very technical issue. Please, please pick up a copy of our, our letter on the CRA. And if you want to talk about state legislation, my colleague Graham has a big paper coming out about why these state laws are, are preempted. And so he's happy to talk to you here. And I want to thank our panel. And we